Um, so on this one, I'm going to try and give um, an overview of, of kind of area and kind of looking somewhat at the, at the architecture of the, of the GPUs and start to talk about how this will influence the, the algorithms and so forth. And then on Friday, I'll, I'll probably be talking about a new paper that came out this summer that talks about designing algorithms specifically for the GPUs. There have been, there have been a lot of papers over the last 10 years on designing algorithms for the GPU, but they've more been, you know, let's see how fast we can get this particular thing like sorting to run, as opposed to really analyzing the, um, the details of the model. So when I, when I taught this two years ago, I kind of tried to work through some of those and I had to derive some stuff myself. Now there's actually a paper that does probably a much better job than I would have done my own. Um, so I'll try and talk about that on Friday. And that's linked off the web page on, on, uh, on Friday's uh, um, on Friday's row, um, if you want to find that paper. Um, so, so what I'll talk about today is kind of, we'll kind of see how GPUs evolved and where they fit in this, this spectrum of, you know, architectures and tools for, um, for large data. Um, so, let's see. So, um, so let's start um, back in, um, so a lot of this actually happened here at, uh, um, here at Utah when they're developing the first um, techniques for doing graphics on computers. And if, if, if any of you have not taken a graphics course, um, and maybe this is even not taught as much in a graphics course anymore. I haven't, you know, I, when I took one, it was probably almost 10 years ago. Um, so so, so I, I think they would still teach this stuff. But, um, you know, the idea is that there's some, uh, and I'll explain how this connects to the hardware and everything uh, um, eventually, but you're supposed to be at some location X, and you're seeing some object, and you're seeing it through the screen. And the screen is made up of all these pixels. And so the idea is you're here and you have a view of some object here. And each pixel has you know, its, its representation of if you shot a ray um, from this X through this pixel, you would see this part of the image. Right? So, so this is the underlying geometry. And then the image is typically represented as uh, uh, what people usually call a soup of triangles. right? So you have a whole bunch of these triangles up here. And usually the triangles are not in this kind of weird thing where it's not showing anything. It's usually, you, if you have some object, you decompose the surface of it into, into triangles. And then you, um, but, but then the, as far as the hardware and the underlying uh, so software is concerned, you just have a set of triangles up here. So then when you shoot this from this perspective point uh, through each of the pixels, you're going to see and you're going to hit one of these triangles. And you're going to see which triangle you hit first. So if the triangle is, um, he, he is going to be opaque, then you just need to report whichever triangle comes first. Um, if the triangle is not opaque, it's partially transparent, then you can see through that triangle and then you can hit another triangle behind it. And each of those will have properties. The first triangle you see will have uh, colors associated with it. And then um, if there's some transparency, then you're going to kind of add together a bunch of colors you see based on the amount of transparency. So a weighted addition of a, of a bunch of things. Um, and so these turn out to be the two key, key operations. Um, for each pixel, you kind of want to see which object is in front. And this turns out to be something like, uh, um, something like a max operator. And then you want to see through things and kind of add them up, and this turns out to be like, um, like a sum operator. Okay, so each pixel, and you have this ray tracing. So, so this is this is ray tracing, but this is often how you. This is what the graphics cards were built to do very efficiently. So each pixel is doing this, and they're each doing this essentially independently. Um, so if you have a ton of pixels on your on your monitor, you need to do this for every single pixel. Um, so this, um, so, so there were these, so the graphics cards were these hardware that were developed to do this very efficiently for each pixel, and eventually they realized we should do this in parallel for each of the pixels. 
a lot of the data that you had was this world representation, which is stored in some memory, and then each of the pixels need to, to access this memory. So they were building these highly parallel, essentially, CPUs, and, it was, and eventually people realized you could actually use them for you know, highly parallel computation. But that was not you know, the original insight. They thought it was specific for just these sort of operations. There's other things you do with light and so forth that, that um, kind of came later. So this, so this is kind of a one slide overview. But let's, uh, yeah, so, so you can do things. And so this, okay, so, so this was actually drawn with, uh, I think this was, this is supposed to be like a martini glass that's drawn, I think with a bunch of triangles, although they were smooth using some techniques, and you could kind of see through them and there's reflection, so instead of going through, you had bouncing, and you could kind of do these all with the same sort of operations. Uh, this is another thing drawn GPU, and this ends up being a bunch of small, tiny triangles. Um, and this one, you can actually see some of the triangles on here. Um, so th these pictures were from uh, some things I did when I was an undergrad, so um, they're probably not the most pretty things, but they're what I could find from 10 years ago, when you could actually tell what the, what the GPU was doing. Um, <laughs> so so <laughs> I, I'm sorry if, if you're kind of ugly with that. Um, all right, so, um, so, so, we're laughing with you, actually. Yeah, well, that's what I'm hoping, but you know, <laughs> it, it, one of those things you can never tell. Um, so, so, um, let's see, so, um, so, let's see, this in the 1980s, there were these things called glitters in, in hardware, which were used for drawing, you know, um, which were used when, uh, uh, when Microsoft Windows came out. For those who don't remember, you know, before this, there were, you actually, everything was on the command line, essentially, and there wasn't anything else unless you used specialized things where you just drew, like, the graphics, which was kind of developed here. But before Windows, you weren't, actually seeing the individual pixels, they just needed to write letters and stuff. That was much simpler. Uh, th this was actually um, drawing these bitmaps and quickly moving them onto the, onto, the, onto the GPU. And so specialized hardware started to come about when people realized it was nice to have these graphical user interfaces as opposed to just this, the whole screen is just one command. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you aren't, aren't old enough to actually remember this happening, but um, and then, you know, the, the thing that really moved us forward were these, these, these cool games, these, um, these 3D games. I think this is maybe Duke Nukem, is that right? Um, um, or maybe Doom? I, I, I don't know, it was one of these games. And see, it's, hard to, it's a little bit hard to tell because really all of the games kind of looked the same because there was um, one or maybe two kind of graphics engines that they're all built with. And, I mean, if you look really closely, there are lots of triangles in here. And maybe in some cases you could actually see the triangles, like in one of those, those images I showed you earlier. Um, the lights on top of What? Square, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. So see these, these lights they made? Yeah, square, because it was easier to do. Um, so, um, yeah, and there are all these cool tricks where like you had one object like this hand maybe was in every scene, so you pre-compute um, a lot of stuff for the pixels for that, so that doesn't change. You know? So you can have a lot more detail there in, in those cases. And there's all these sort of tr tricks you need to do. And so this was through using OpenGL and DirectX. Um, so, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this, this uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so this was, I guess, with triangle rasterization, not exactly with, 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 with ray tracing, because the ray tracing, kind of what I described earlier, was, was taking, usually took too long to do for these games. So you had kind of these other kind of shortcuts, shortcuts you were doing with the triangles. Okay. So, um, so it was the first language to write in the GPU, uh, was this OpenGL? This wasn't quite right. OpenGL was actually, Originally, when it came out, it was just um, a, a specification of what the hardware would actually do. And it was kind of, you know, 
not much above assembly, but kind of you know closer to assembly for um, on the graphics card. It was it was very low level, and as it evolved, you started to be able to do some uh, some more interesting operations, which abstracted out things people were commonly doing. Um, so the the first things was the first language was really um, through direct X on, on on Windows. So this is still mainly the case, but not as much anymore. A lot of the gaming was done on only Windows for a lot of time because they had much better uh, uh, libraries and stuff for writing graphics, um, you know, through the Windows operating system on their graphics card. So you couldn't really play all the cool games on a Mac or on, on Linux. You needed a Windows box for your games. Um, but this is in the 90s where you had Linux. No, there was there 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 were people using um, various other operating systems back then. True, but they weren't. But you know, even in the in the in the 2000s, this was mainly in 2000s, and, and uh, there were you know people had a separate even if they were had, a, had their Linux box, they had a separate box for gaming, or they you know had to do everything else in Windows because they were the gaming was the most important thing they had, so they. Their best, their best computer was for their game, um, and so let's see. There are these ATI and Nvidia were kind of the two main uh, companies developing these these graphics cards. Um, okay, so they're the, and they're they they kept adding uh, higher higher level kind of functionality on them. Um, so so. This, so there's kind of a pipeline that kind of worked here, kind of like if you know how uh, pipelining works in, in a CPU, kind of somewhat similar, there would be this vertex data which came in, which was describing your, your triangles, um, and you would, you would uh, take this data and there was something that was called the vertex shader, which translated this into information about the pixels. Um, so and then the fragment shader would, um, that there'd be, uh, Various triangles a pixel could see, and then the fragment shader would um, uh, would do something on top of that image. And so, kind of this this basic pipeline. And there was different hardware for this than there was for this. Um, and then they kind of added more and more um, more and more different types of hardware and functionality on top of this. Um, Vertex data is the triangles. Uh, yeah, so so this is it's called various things in various locations. So, uh, but the, my understanding was this was essentially about the geometry of the scene through vertices and triangles, and this at some point became pixels, and then you had more operations you did on individual pixels. Um, the what? Yeah. First step. Well, so this it takes in all the information about the super triangles, and here it does something for each pixel. So it it all the triangles are passed in, and stuff is passed out for each individual pixel. And then you have a bunch of information for each pixel, and the fragment shader would kind of aggregate that or sum that information. Maybe take the maximum. Um, so I, I'm sorry to admit I'm not. You know, this is somewhat far from my expertise, so, so I, if I can't answer your question exactly, I apologize a bit. The last time I was programming these things, it works in such a way. First of all, we do some operations for each, for each vertex. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say you complete the color of the vertex. And once you've done that, you go for each pixel. And each pixel is determined by the neighboring vertices. Okay? Of course, if you just get this to be just triangle, but you can also do it further. So basically, you can imagine that you just in the same way as we did for math we use, you, you may have this the same way. Similar, similar, right? You have this, you just write them. So, a uh, function for vertex, a uh, function for, uh, for pixels, and then there are GPU runs. Yeah. So, too bad we right, so, so, so well, so as well, I, as I'll try and mention there, you get different advantages for here as opposed to. Things like, like MapReduce. So, it, it originally there were separate hardware for each of these components. Um, eventually, um, what happened is the GPU had essentially 
one memory and then one um, one common hardware for doing all the processing. And that allowed you to write the, the vertex programmers, whatever um, programs, the geometry programs, the pixel programs, all of these would work on the same hardware. Right? And now, more generally, you can do these more general purpose compute programs, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, so, so eventually they realized that you really need to do a lot of things in, in uh, parallel in the same way, and it was more efficient to focus on one set of hardware that would do, do all of these operations. Um, okay, and uh, so, um, so, and so then people started trying to do more powerful operations and they added more functionality. You could offer, you know, certain, uh, like, uh, ways of that, that look like you're, you're writing in C for doing these things. Um, um, so as Clement was saying, like often you would have these two, main functions, one for the dealing with each of the vertices and one for dealing with each of the, each of the pixels, and each of these would run, um, would be parallelized uh, on, the, on the same hardware, um, you know, one after the other. Um, but you, you would just basically write these two main functions in the right way and it would parallel, if you wrote it the right way, it would officially parallelize them on the hardware. Um, um, and you start to be able to have these uh, local variables and passing them in between um, different, different elements in your scene or different pieces. Um, okay. um, so then, so um, the, the kind of, if you've ever programmed in these for general purpose, you've probably heard of CUDA. Um, so, so, so this was developed by NVIDIA and uh, this came out with the GeForce 8000 line. Um, and now you can basically run general, um, general, C code, um, <laughs> general C code on top of this. Um, so it, it doesn't, it's more, in some ways it's more restrictive than running um, on a regular, say if you just have like a multi-core general CPU, there are certain things you really will need to worry about in order to get it to run efficiently. So we'll try and um, I'll look at some of these things. Um, but instead of maybe getting an 8-core, 16-core CPU, you're going to have something like where you have thousands of cores, where you have like two to 4,000 different cores. Each can do something in parallel. right? And, and this is not for that much more or roughly the same as you can for one of these 8-core, these, uh, um, 16-core core CPU. How, how is uh, this GPU model different from uh, models like VRAM? Oh, so we'll talk about that. So the the the, the, the main difference between um, between so PRAM is with shared completely shared memory. The GPU there turns out there's there's a bit more in the hierarchy. So you don't have complete sharing of the memory. Um, you have partial share. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll draw some diagrams which I'll try and help make this a bit more clear. Um, okay, so there's some other stuff that was developed along the way. Eventually, you know, Apple had some, some, uh, some, some allowed you to do this on some of, there was some hardware that worked with Apple that allowed you to do some of this GPU programming as well. Um, and so then, uh, you know, there's, there's different functionality that was the hardware could do specially and so forth. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so when you, if you start reading about these GPU programs, you start hearing about these, these, these claims which, uh, which are really exciting, right? So think of, you have one, one graphics card and you're getting something like three teraflops, you know, which is, is ex extremely fast, right? You're not gonna get a GPU which is running this fast. Um, and so, so I, and you're getting, um, um, so you're getting something like 100 plus, you know, up to like 200 gigabytes a second uh, a memory access band. Now this is between the, the processors on the GPU and the memory on the GPU, but it's extremely fast. Um, and it's getting much easier to program. You're getting, you know, you can start using like even this C++ as opposed to just C. Type, type What's the price range of these top of the line? You know, uh, how, how many 
Okay, good. It's that level. Yeah, yeah. So it's... In Europe, I don't know here, but we bought mm -hmm. one of the best when we played in Cuba. It yeah. was 2 gigabytes of RAM. It was, I think it's around 600 euros in Europe. So here it's even cheaper. Oh, um, probably, yeah. So so actually, Unless we have... Uh, well, well, um, we have a cluster of GPUs here. So actually, Mary Hall, uh, I think she's teaching a class in the spring about GPU programming. That's it's all, how do you get the most out of this GPU program? So I'm spending two lectures on it, giving kind of an algorithmic point of view. She'll talk a lot more about the, the details of hardware and how you actually really optimize these things. Um, and, and we have a cluster here. And if you take the class, you'll get to use it and really see what you can do with, uh, you know, with, the, with the hardware. Um, so and you, you, know, you really cannot get the, the the price per teraflops, there's really no cheaper way of doing it, right? So there was, the, the, uh, there are these big iron boxes, right? Which were these these um, these multi-core CPUs with very uh, fast uh, memory access and so forth. But these were like these traditional CPUs which had very fast pipelines and so forth. And then one way of getting cheaper computation was uh, how Google was doing was buying these very cheap, um, um, like um, these commodity machines, and figuring out how to scale these up. The other way of doing it, which ends up being even more efficient, but a bit more restrictive as well, as we'll see, is with using the GPUs, where you have you know, three teraflops here, you're getting um, for five or 600 bucks, whatever it is, under $1,000, you're getting uh, maybe 4,000 processors. Right now, the processors won't be as fast as the CPU, but you're going to get a ton more of them, like a factor, you know, maybe a factor uh, um, ten or a hundred more CPUs than, than you would otherwise, um, or processors than you would otherwise. Um, and becoming much more easy to program. Uh, there's MATLAB integration, so if you want to do stuff on MATLAB and parallelize it, and you you have the right sort of a, a GPU in your machine, um, and you you know, put the right thing in your MATLAB code, it'll automatically speed this up. I'll show an example of how the speeds of, of uh, how this running on, on MATLAB works and what sort of things um, work. You know, and, and this has, there are a lot of technologies which have, applications which have taken advantage of this, fully at home. We'll talk a bit more about this, I think, in a week. Um, stuff in Photoshop, Mathematica, and so forth. Um, so th there, there are lots of applications which, there's, there's no other efficient way to speed these things up um, um, outside of, the, at the same scale you can on the GPU that you could otherwise. Uh, Clusters of the commodity machines would cost much more than the same thing on the, on the GPUs. But this, was, we see this won't work for everything. Um, it, you really need things that are going to be really highly parallel. Um, so, like the last algorithms we talked about for MapReduce was things that you could parallel fairly arbitrarily, but some of the first things, you know, if you had more than 100 machines, you didn't really get this, some of the algorithms we had, if you had more than 100 machines, you weren't really going to get the same degree of, of parallelism beyond that. Um, here you want things to really, at every step of the process, be, um, be able to parallelize to 4,000 different processors. Um, and not just that, you, you want them to be extremely regular, right? So the same thing, the same sort of operations to be done on every single one of the processors. Um, and generally, you want each of these, these steps on the individual processors to be fairly simple, fairly simple operations. Um, if I have time at the end of the slides, I'll kind of quickly describe what was the, the fastest way to sort things on a, GPU for a long time um, called the um, called the bitonic sort. There have been things that have beaten this actually using ideas kind of like kind of like the Terra sort, where you split things a bit. But we'll, um, but I'll, I'll try and give. They still need it at the low level to use some stuff like this. Um, so we so we get a new cluster of machines that's going to be driving this car to each one and give them that for both worlds. Um, you could do that, eh? um, and there are clusters out like that. So then your your map and your reduce operations would need to be t 
tailored to be efficient on the GPU. So not only would you need to break up your thing into your map and reduce rounds, but in the map and reduce that you dealt with, you would need to uh, imp you know, code those off efficiently for the GPU. So you would need to use both. So these, these two uh, worlds, MapReduce and GPUs, are really uh, uh, fairly orthogonal to each other. So one of the key things you need to worry about, um, and this is, relates to some of the stuff we talked about earlier, is one is there's really a hierarchy of how your data needs to be organized here, um, much more so than before. And you need to really worry about how the memory, how the data is moved around. Um, because as you get closer to the processors, you're going to have access and, sh and you share less and less memory. Um, so you really need to be careful how you move information so you can uh, so, so, so you can do the operations on there. One of kind of the claims of MapReduce is that you're moving the computation to the data. It's not entirely true. The shuffle step is really moving the data around to um, in certain ways. Um, but it's the, the first map step is really doing operations on the data before it gets moved. Here you really need to worry about moving the data to the processors and thinking through what that means. Um, okay, so, um, so, so, so how you can, so let's start trying to look at how this architecture works. You're gonna, at the low level, you're gonna have the rest of your computer here. You've got the system memory. This will be attached to your hard drive and also um, to your CPU. Um, and then there's also a GPU memory which is separate. That there's some um, some gap between here. There's an L2 cache, and then there's L1 cache, and each of these is going to have a screen processor. And we'll break this down in a little bit more. I'll show you kind of a diagram of the screen processor in a bit. Um, each of the so th this data was from a couple of years ago, uh, and um, I, I was looking at it recently, and things have not changed too much in the last couple of years. There was a lot of uh, improvement in this in probably the four or five years before that, but the last two years I, I didn't really see much increased improvement um, in the in the in the sizes and speeds of these things. Um, so 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 each of the um, each of the L1 caches are going to be pretty small, um, only 16 to 48 uh, kilobytes of data. So what is this? Um, um, a screen processor, uh, so I'll, it, it doesn't really have to do with streaming as we did earlier, but that's what they're called. So, so this is gonna be another part of the hierarchy. So this is the top part of the hierarchy. There's gonna be more hierarchy captured within each of these, these SM boxes. Okay, um, so um, the, the memory um, is not gonna be coherent. You need to worry about um, uh, how you how you um, control the access to this memory? It's not um, you don't have these uh, concurrent read concurrent write properties. Um, so the, if you looked at the same what's usually called the L1 cache on the CPU, um, it's it's going to be bigger by maybe um, um, by maybe an order of magnitude. Okay, so you're going to typically have a much bigger L1 cache on the, on the CPU. Um, so then the, the L2 cache, um, you know, uh, again, is, is, is not going to be that much bigger than, than the L1 cache. Usually, you're going to have the property that the L2 cache is bigger than the sum of all of the L1 caches, right? So you're going to have a bunch of these different things. Um, I think in some of these, you have something like, was, uh, I think I'll see numbers later how many stream processes you have. Maybe you're going to have, like, 64 of them, or um, I forget, it'll be on the slides in a second. Um, but you want the sum of all these sizes to fit in the L2 cache, just so you can pass information around, uh, not too hard. And this is again, you know, significantly smaller than a CPU, um, but the memory bandwidth is gonna, be, is, gonna, is gonna be really fast. It's gonna be much, um, maybe not quite an order of magnitude, but maybe you say a factor of, uh, five um, faster than on, on the CPU. So they're going to be smaller, but you're going to be able to move stuff a lot faster, which is it's not so surprising. The less, the less space you have, it should be the easier to, to, to send the data. Um, 
So, um, but the, the total GPU memory size is going to be significantly smaller than on uh, um, also than on CPUs. Um, some of some people have been pushing for like these these commodity machines that are used with MapReduce to have uh, memory is almost as large as probably you have as your hard drive and your desktop, so, so that you can you can do um, you can you can always keep everything in, the, in memory. In here, you know maybe. So this this is only one of the only numbers I updated. This 12 gigabytes. This is you could fit maybe 12 gigabytes in the memory. And this is a machine that came out uh, probably came out in the last two years. Before that, the top of line I saw was only um, was only six gigabytes. Now maybe that's still enough space. Um, 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 but it might not be. So on a general um, on a desktop, you can get like 120 gigabytes if you want to get really high performance. So the, these are generally the comparisons people. So, um, okay, so yeah, so so if you look back this box, there are a bunch of these stream processors, and here's a profile of this G80 series, which is still close to the top of the line, I guess. Um, um, as 128 of these stream processors, okay, and these stream processors. Are um, let's see each these stream processors will itself have 16 of these multiprocessors, right? So so if you look, there are 128 of these, and each of these boxes is going to have 16 multiprocessors inside, um, and each multiprocessor will have eight processing units, right? So the total number of processing units is going to be 128 times 16 times eight. Um, which um, is, should be around uh, low thousands. I think. So, um, the, so the processor units in the multiprocessor are the stream processors. Are the stream, the stream processors stream? are the ones sitting here. Inside of each stream processor, you have sixteen multiprocessors. Each multiprocessor is eight processing units. Um, I looked up one. So I think. Uh, what? So I guess sixteen thousand. Often you'll just look at these. These multiprocessors can basically do uh, have like just like one or two registers of memory, um, but these have so you can do something more interesting. The multiprocessors. So generally, this is called the number of processors. Yeah. The multiprocessors is is better to think of as kind of. The, the, the stages of a pipeline within uh, a regular CPU processor. Uh, so typically people count 128 times 16 as the number of uh, uh, parallel CPU cores. So in this one, I believe this 28, uh, 2880 came from the stream processors times the, the multiprocessors. Uh, but you can have a factory more level <coughs> uh, perhaps. But, uh, in order to really access these, you need to write very specialized code to really get those. those um, do, and they it, all have, do they all have to be running the same code? Uh, so or is it possible to say multiprocessor number or stream processor number one, you run this code, stream processor number two, you run something else? So, so at, within each multiprocessor, they all have to run essentially the same code. Um, and typically, you want them all to be running the same code, or maybe you could do a couple of things. But keep in mind, when if these each have you know a couple of registers of memory, you know the code itself takes up space in memory too, right? So you can't fit the code down. You can only you're basically sending these um, these ins, um, basically something like assembly instructions um, at at this level down here. Um, at this level, you can do some stuff. So, but I, I, I've talked to people who are like really highly optimize these things, and they really they think about it in terms of assembly at this level. If you're getting kind of the craziest possible performance out of these things, um, and you know, the, the, there's a there's a some people who who do this and get these incredible speeds. Um, okay, so here's here's a picture or a diagram of a stream processor. Um, 
So, so this is one stream processor. So if you remember, this is one of these boxes. It's gonna should look like. So this is supposed to be one stream processor, and so you're gonna have. In this case, it looks like they have um, 32 cores. Each of these would be a multiprocessor. Um, and then, uh, so you're going to have, this is, would be the, the L1, let's see. So this is the L1 cache down here. Um, but you have these registers associated with each of the cores. Um, I don't know if this is the best layout, but each of these cores, I think, acts as some set of the register file. You really, you, you don't have this, this, uh, um, this concurrent, reconcurrent write. They each have access to a fixed number of, of, the, regi of the registers. Um, and, and then there's some small number of registers on each of the cores. Um, Sure, sure, okay. So yeah, please, you know, feel free to ask me questions. I'll try if I can answer them. Um, okay, so um, if, if you read much of this, if you've read literature on here, um, maybe you've seen this sort of hype about you get these 100 to 200 times speed up running something on a GPU, and maybe you'd expect this. You have, uh, you know, 100 times as many processing units. Um, you know, even the, the multiprocessors are, if you map that to a CPU, you may have 100 times more easily. Um, so if you look, so and there, there have been lots of papers written on these, on these speed ups, and there are some papers written trying to just demonstrate the speed up and not trying to actually tie it to applications. And some of these you need to read very carefully. Um, let me try and mention some of the tricks that can be played within these papers. Um, so th they're not always a, uh, a fair comparison. You may have um, 120 of these GPU cores to one CPU core when really, you know, most laptops would have, you know, if you're trying to look at a, uh, a uh, equivalently priced CPU core of a laptop, it may have four or eight cores instead of one. Um, and so sometimes they'll do optimized GPU code versus unoptimized GPU code. This is Bad research, it happens in every field. It, could hap it happens within this area as well. Um, uh, so when you're doing stuff on a GPU, um, because of the history and graphics, you typically used float operations for, for a lot of the um, uh, um, float uh, variables for a lot of the operations because they didn't need uh, precision beyond that. But in some, say, um, numerical computing, sometimes you'll want to use a, a double, which has twice the precision. Um, if you want to use a double on a, uh, on, on a GPU, it's a whole lot harder because you essentially need to pass two float variables and do specialized operations that aren't built in. It's built to work on floats instead of on doubles. Um, so, and, it's, and often one of the key things is it's very fast memory access within the GPU, but it's slower to transfer money, mem uh, data from, say, the, the memory attached to the CPU or the memory on disk to the GPU. And people often overlook this transfer time. They'll start with the data already loaded in the memory on the GPU, and then they'll run something. And there's some, there's some overhead there, which seems like a fairly real thing. It's a hardware issue. It's not a software issue as much as as, as it necessarily is in, uh, um, in MapReduce. Um, it's not clear if we'll ever be able to completely overcome this, this, uh, this, this hardware issue. But once, if you are doing a lot of stuff on the GPU, you don't need to worry about loading stuff on there, then it can be, um, it, you know, the, you may not have to worry about this, but if you're reading a paper and are maybe skeptical, these are some of the things that, that you want to look at. Um, so, so also as this, so this CUDA, as you, if you've watched it develop, it started basically you could do these fairly simple things. You had to write your program in terms of what looked kind of like max operators and sum operators. And so you couldn't do a lot of complex things. Now you can do all sorts of, uh, you know, 
like you, you can compute a sign function, for instance, on the GPU. Um, uh, it's a, a lot of these operations you can do now. And with that, the, the, as the functionality increased, the speed um, has, 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 you know, has, 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 has decreased a little bit, um, which is, is, is not surprising. As hardware becomes less specialized, it, it becomes not as, as, uh, as efficient. Um, how often, how often can you afford to be using your graphics card like this without compromising your ability to get new data out of your monitor? Oh, I mean, if you're really worried about this, you will turn the monitor off, or you won't have an attached monitor, or you'll have eight graphics cards, okay. or you know, something like that. Um, so you, you could think of putting this on, um, you know, put these machines on a rack and not worry about. Them. Just like you know, every machine in your in your cluster uh, of my machines for MapReduce does not have a monitor attached to it. Right? They're not worried about that. Right? So this the, the viewing stuff is secondary. Um, so how does the GPU cloud look like? How does the GPU cloud? Um, you probably have you you could you uh, so so if, for instance, if you go on Amazon Web Services, you can actually you can actually buy um, hours on, on machines like this. This is one option. To have. So you could have a rack of machines, and on each 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 machine, it may have some number of four or eight of the GPU processors. And each GPU processor, um, or or each GPU, is going to look like this. What I was describing here. So you have even more of this higher. So this is still within the computer. Within the computer itself. It's not like it's sometimes. It's yeah, so it's not isolated. You still but will have a disk so attached and usually yeah, an actual CPU. Mm -hmm. you have the uh, between the between the boxes. Yeah. Right, so that that would still be the same. So, so it's basically just a machine, but it's still it's not the dead one, it just needs to pass the GPU instead of the CPU. Yeah, that's right. Right. So um, so certain things you can do incredibly much faster on the GPU than you could on the CPU. Yeah. So it's just, uh, think of uh, this whole architecture as this huge hierarchy. And this is the, the cheapest way we know how to make the lower levels of the hierarchy, where MapReduce and Google file system kind of describes the higher levels of the hierarchy of, of the cloud. Um, okay, so, so so here's an example. Um, I've got a reference for where I got this. Within a processors, do all of them have to be running the same instruction at the same time, or are they really running independently? Uh, you know, it's it's usually better if you can have them all running the same thing. Um, I believe it's possible for. I, I think for each so the, the, this each is, this frame, this each frame processor, it would not be data. so. So look, the instruction cache is up here. Right. This is a stream processor. Each of these is the multiprocessor, and here's the instruction cache. Now you may be able to have a few different instruction sets that where each multiprocessor is doing one of a small number of these, but you probably don't want each one doing something separate unless the instruction set is extremely simple. But they don't all have to fetch from the same uh, cache address at the same instruction site. Um, I, I, I know some parallel computers have this thing called multiple data single instruction or something like that. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure how that works. Okay. Uh, but I believe typically, typically if you're going to get this to be as, you know, get the most efficiency out of this, and how you want to design your programs, Every stream processor, all the multiprocessors will have the same instruction set. That's typically how you do it. You may be able to do beyond that, but that's kind of really hacking into what you're trying to do. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. I I oh, 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 these are good questions. So, okay. I'm, I'm remembering some of the experiments that my friends were running in high school trying to get some problem processing going. Yeah. So t t typically, uh, 
I mean, sometimes if you really, really know what you're doing, you can hack and get improvements, but you typically want to kind of do what it's designed for and understand what, how it's designed to operate. Okay, so, so a reference to where I got this at the end of the slides, but um, so this is some trying to use MATLAB on, on the GPU, and here's the thing where, let's see, what is it doing? It's, it's running a, um, a bunch of these in, in parallel. It's, it's first building this really large array, um, this is called CPUX, which is going to be a really large array. Um, so it, it builds the array in memory, and then the GPU array kind of essentially is transferring this onto the GPU. That's what this instruction is doing. Um, so then this GPUX is then on the GPU. Um, and then for each of the elements, it's computing the sum. Okay? Um, and then it's gathering it off the GPU. This is moving it back from the GPU onto the CPU. So I believe if you have the new version of MATLAB and you call operations like this, you can get stuff to run on the, on the, um, on the GPU this way um, if you have the proper hardware image. Um, it should be pretty straightforward to do. Um, so now if you look at the run times of these things as, I, as you look at the, um, at the number of, of, of elements, it's increasing linearly with all of these. Um, the blue is the CPU time. So if I just ran this on MATLAB on a state-of-the-art machine from two years ago, um, and uh, just, just ran computed all these sign functions, which is, should be uh, one of the things here, you're going to get this blue line. So the more elements, the longer it's taking. It's basically linear. Um, and if you're just looking at the, the, the running on the GPU, which is essentially just counting this operation right here, you're going to get this green line, which is faster by, looks like, um, by like a factor of three, roughly. Um, but if you count the, the GPU, um, this transferring to the GPU and getting back from the GPU, the transfer time, you're going to get this red line, which is slower than doing the CPU. All right, so it's doing something highly in parallel. It's, it's computing the signs much faster on the GPU than the CPU, but the transfer time is, is really is really slowing this down. Okay, so let's look at, um, all right, so then this is a, another example. The only thing that changed here is this instead just a sign is some big trick function. It's, a, it's 10 sines and cosines, right? You're doing some, a bunch of these operations as opposed to just one. So what this is doing is it's saying the um, it's trying to overwhelm the transfer time by the actual computation cost, right? So now I'm doing the same thing, and the um, so here's the CPU time in blue. Here's the 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 the, um, the, the GPU time, and it's faster now by by the even even larger amount. Um, looks like a factor of uh, six or something. And with the transfer time in green, it's still faster by maybe a factor of three. So as you're doing much more operations here, it can overwhelm the transfer time. But if you don't look at the transfer time, you're, you're not getting the true kind of cost here. So one thing you need to look at is moving stuff on and off. The GPU may take some time. Um, OK. Uh, so let's see. I, this is where I got some of this, <coughs> this information. Um, all right. So um, I've got a little bit of time left. Does anyone have any high-level questions about this? I can try and sketch how how the, the um, how the um, the Vitonic sort worked and why it made sense to run on. So I'm just going to kind of uh, sketch this pretty pretty quickly here. So um, um, the bitonic sort, um, 
is is going to be kind of like um, is kind of like the merge sort, um, but it, it does a couple things which make it more more fine grained parallel, right? So so if we're working on on a um, um, on a GPU, what we want are things which are um, highly parallel um, and um, very fine grained. So, so what we want to be able to do is, is every thing we want to do to be uh, to, to essentially have essentially the same basic operations and to be able to do this across all the data we have at once. So, um, so, uh, um, so in, in order to define this, we need to define a uh, bitonic um, sequence. Um, it's so, so it, it, it's going to um, increase. Um, so it's it's going to have an increasing. Um, uh, um, um, it's, 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 it's going to have increasing subsequence and a decreasing subsequence, and so one of these might be empty. So, so an example of this. So, if you say something like one, three, seven, eight. Um, so this is monotonic. It's always increasing, right? So this, something can be monotonic if it's always decreasing. Also, so something which is bitonic is something which will can increase and then and then decrease. So let's say one, three, eight, um, ten, seven, uh, two, zero. So it increases to ten, and then after ten it only decreases. There's only one maximum. You could also have it going the other way: twelve, um, nine, eight, uh, one, three, six. 13, right? So it's decreasing down to 1, and then it's only increasing afterwards. So all these sequences are bitonic. Well, you have at most one maximum and most one minimum. Yeah, wrong. Well, you, exactly. well, okay. So either you have at most one maximum, you have two minimum here, one and zero both minimum. Uh, but then they're on the, they're on the, and, and, um, you have at most, you, the, these, both these are local minimum. Um, getting into more terminology than I need to. Okay, so um, if you're doing a merge sort, merge sort, you're dealing with sequences which are uh, I'm always monotonic, essentially always increasing. Um, so, um, but by fine grain. Um, so we'll see what this means a little bit. So we'll um, hopefully I'll be able to get into the details enough. Um, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a sequence and it's going to work kind of like the merge sort. We're going to, I'm going to kind of draw a high level picture here. Um, we're going to break it into, into chunks of size two. You know, these are meant to be things that we're going to compare. Right, so these are these are objects. And so we're going to take these two two chunks and create one single chunk. And and we're going to have the the uh, the property that at every level we're we're always going to have within each chunk we're going to have a of a uh, bitonic sequence. Um, and, and I think it's going to it's going to alternate from being um, from being with a single minimum to being to, to having a single maximum each round. Um, so, so if you're doing a merge sort, so, so let me try and motivate for a second before I get into the details. If you're doing a merge sort here, you um, so on a merge sort, 
you're getting these two ordered sequences, right? Um, so you, you're getting these things which are, and you can look at the head and you compare which one of these and you're, you're going to output, right? So, so how you need to do this is you need to scan over each of these elements and you need to process them um, one by one. So when you're doing this merging between two things, you have something which is actually some subpart which is very um, sequential in here. Now you can do a lot in parallel, but this step is kind of going to be um, fairly sequential. Now the other way that we that we got around this for parallel algorithms is we we had um, um, a whole bunch more of these things, and so we we looked at the head of of all of these cues, and we compared all of these operations, right? So now we had a bigger split, and we need to compare all of these. But now this comparison is going to be trickier. We need to compare all all of these different things at once. You get more parallelism here in merging together the cues, um, but you had a trickier operation here. So the bitonic sort will allow us to do all of kind of the merge step in some way, which is going to be um, um, every every comparison is going to be essentially running the same code, and it's going to be very simple, um, and you're not going to have such a sequential thing going on. Okay, so um, Let's see if I can write up some pseudocode here. Um, um, okay, so. So the, the the downside of that is that the 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 merge step will take log n parallel steps. It looks like so the total runtime is going to be I think it's going to be n log squared n instead of n log n. But we're going to be able to get a much more parallelism than than doing something like this. Um, so we're going to have a so so this is going to be an operation which is going to take as input as yeah so so I, I didn't uh, Yeah, so you can be able to do this from both sides at uh, on the kind of both sides at once. Right. So let's let's see how this see how this works. So um, you, the, the input is is going to be a bitonic. So so how this will work is yeah. So so we're gonna if you look at Two of these these things, we're actually going to force that these this one is going to be increasing and this one is going to be decreasing. Um, so so both these are monotonic, but the input to them that is if I merge them together is going to be bitonic. So then the key operation is going to be the input is a um, bitonic sequence a of size n, and the the output is going to be an increasing um, sequence. Um, what do I want to call this? Uh, B. Oops. Size 10. Right, so we're going to take essentially two of these as input, and these are going to be sorted, not just bitonic. And then the input is going to be both of them, and they're going to be bitonic. Um, so then, let's see, we do 4h equals 1 to log n. Um, so 
one n, um, and so, so this this for loop is going to be sequential. Um, but then I'll have two more for loops here equals uh, one to n over two to the h, and this I can write in parallel. J equals to, I'll, I'll write this up and, and then um, hopefully we can figure out how it works. Um, so, uh, okay, so B. This is, is going to get the the min of AI and uh, then oh, the same thing. Right, so we're going to take two of these elements from A. Right? The minimum we're going to put in one thing of B, and the maximum we're going to put in the other. And we're going to do this for, we can do this for all of the different things in the array in parallel. And in log n steps, we're going to go from a uh, thing that's bitonic to something that's going to be um, always increasing. Um, and you can, if you flip these things, you get one that's always decreasing, because you need this one to be always increasing and this one to always be decreasing. And so this one would, getting to that one would be done the opposite way. Okay, so this is probably pretty, pretty confusing here. So let me, I've, I've got an example, some notes here. So let me try and sketch up this, this example here. Um, oh no, okay, both of this, okay, this sequence, this input seems to actually just be by time. Okay, good. Uh, ten. So this is our input, and n in this case looks like it's 16. Okay, so I'm going to split here into two halves. Um, so for the first round of h, I'm splitting into two halves. And I need to ensure, so th this the sequence is bitonic, the minimum is here at 2, right? And the end is going to be all, all sorted from smallest to largest. Okay, so the first thing I do is, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll write up what it is, and then we can, we can look at it. Let's see what I did. At the first round, I compared, I broke into two halves, so I compared the first one 
from this half and the first one and this half and put the smaller one here and the larger one here. And I did the same with 11 and 20. 11 same. Okay, so, so what's going to happen is that um, if the minimum is on the left, it's going to stay on the left. And then you know everything up here has to be increasing um, because it, uh, it was still, it, it was mapped from here and these have to be larger. Um, and then I'm, the things on the right, which are s smaller than over here, I'm going to move over onto the left. Um, I believe the property I should have at the end is that all of the things on the left are going to be smaller than all the things on the right. That's, that's the claim. If that's true, then, then I can repeat this. Right, so let's see. So Is, isn't it a liability that we have to rearrange the input list into a bitonic sequence before we can even start sorting? No, because that really is competition. Well, so how do you start, how do you get into bitonic is you're going to, um, um, you're starting, initially this is your list and it's in any order and any two elements sequences by top. So I'm starting these two, I'm doing two, and to, to, if, in fact every two elements is increasing. So this set of four elements, I can take these two and sort them so they're, this is increasing, this is decreasing. Then I can take these four elements, and this four elements are bitonic. Then I do this, make these increasing, sort them so this is increasing, and take these four which are bitonic, and do the opposite so these are decreasing. Now the set of eights is bitonic. And then I run this again on the set of eights and make these increasing, and another set of eights is going to be decreasing. And then I keep in going. In the process, we've added another log in number of operations. Which yeah, that's, uh, that's right, that's right. So th this is not, so people have figured out how to do more efficient things on the GPU after this. But okay. this, people, are, every operation here is, you know, is, is, is basically the same. The min goes one place, the max goes the other. And the min and max operations are one of these, these early operators that, that we were able to do okay. um, on the GPU. So we could do it. Entirely in terms of you know the th this 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 simple comparison, and this was um, parallel across all the data had had this these same operation. So you had an extra log end around, and so since then people have been able to figure out how to speed this up by first decomposing the data into sets a bit a bit better um, using things like the TerraSort where you. You sample things or did some splitters at a high level first and then did this on the low level and this speeds things up a little bit. Um, if, we, if we are trying to apply this as a low level uh, operation to implement a larger TerraSort, doesn't the overhead of shoving data on off the GPU card start becoming nasty? Uh, that's definitely an issue, yes. I, I okay. agree. You would, you would need that this operation to be much faster than doing it on the, on the CPU. Um, there, are, there are papers out there that definitely claim that's the case. Um, I don't know enough to, uh, to verify that. I, I believe it seems like sorting is something that you can actually speed up doing on the GPU. That's Assuming we're just sorting integers, but if we we're having to sort like customer records by last name or something like that, well, so the the thing is, if you're if you're if you're doing that, you're yeah, that's that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, if you're doing more harder comparisons like that, that's going to be trickier to do. Um, yeah, so so sometimes you can map them to integers that maintains the order. Um, and then you can you can sort the integers, and then you can map back a sorted index and rearrange things um, offline. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I'll do one more round of, of 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 this here just to show you how it works. Now I'm comparing um, just this half of the data, and I compare four and ten. I should get four, two and eleven. 
Um, so the 10 went here, the 11 went here, 5 here, 12 here, 8 here, 9 here. Again, everything, the smaller half of the numbers are all here, the larger half is all here. Um, I can do the same thing with this half, I'm going to split here, I get 22 and 24, 20, 30, 15, 32, and so I haven't moved much here. I only swapped the 22 and the 24. Um, this, right. seems, this seems to be um, very similar to a shell sort. So it's very, it's very similar to a bubble sort of two partitions instead of a bit. Yeah, which is what a shell sort is. Yeah, so, so it's, it's some of these sorting things end up being very similar to each other. This, um, okay. yeah, so that's, that's possible. Um, that, that just builds intuition on why this whole thing should work. Yeah, right, right, right. So, um, so, so, I, 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 so, this is not asymptotically the most efficient way to sort data, even on on, on the GPU. But um, I've I've kind of illustrated that it's every step you're able to do all these comparisons in parallel. Um, you're able to do. Um, n over 2 comparisons in parallel, even though um, what, so, so if I have enough processors, I can load them in the, in the right location and swap, swap them against each other. So I, you know, I would put these two um, registers in the same um, GPU and compare, some, compare them and map them back to these two registers, right, um, back in the shared memory. And I don't need um, it's like a single pivot I'm comparing everything to um, or anything sequential. Everything here is completely parallelized. So, that, so this is what I mean by the fine-grained and highly parallel. And this is the sorts of things you want to try and achieve using um, when you're doing stuff on the GPUs. Um, okay, so it looks like we're out of time. So on, on Friday I'll try and talk a little bit more about how to think of a model for this and uh, maybe some more interesting um, I think I'll probably do that if I, um, for some reason I can't do that, I may talk about this, 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 this other model that they can use about how to do things in, in, a, in a hierarchy instead of just IRA efficient if you're more interested in it.